Dobry wieczór. Nazywam się Michał Trebacz, jestem kierownikiem działu naukowego Muzeum Historii Żydów Polskich POLIN i mam przyjemność przedstawić naszego dzisiejszego gościa, doktora Daniela Kupfera Hellera z Monash University, a nie jak napisaliśmy na stronie internetowej z Montrealu, ale to zmiany, które się zadziały niezależnie od nas i w trakcie negocjowania dzisiejszego wykładu. A wykład dzisiaj będzie zatytułowany Ojczyzna. Czy można mieć dwie ojczyzny? Prawicowy syjonizm w drugiej Rzeczypospolitej. Wykład będzie w języku angielskim, więc e, jeśli ktoś z Państwa e, chciałby skorzystać z tłumaczenia, które mamy, a zapomniał jeszcze o tym, żeby pobrać słuchawki, to może to jeszcze zrobić zanim rozpoczniemy. E, I przedstawiając e, doktora Cholera, chciałem e, powiedzieć, że zajmuje się on oczywiście e, prawicowym syjonizmem, zajmował się historią syjonizmu i współczesnego Izraela, a także historią stosunków polsko-żydowskich oraz e, historią pomocy humanitarnej. A jego książka, którą tutaj Państwu mogę e, pokazać, e, która znajduje się w zbiorach naszej biblioteki, e, zatytułowana jest e, Żabotyński's Children, Polish e, Jews and the Rise of the Right Wing Zionism. I mam nadzieję, a właściwie jestem pewien, że ten dzisiejszy wykład będzie e, ważnym naukowym wgłosem w dyskusji, która toczy się w Polsce od lat wokół prawicowego syjonizmu e, wokół Betaru i Żabotyńskiego. E, życzę Państwu przyjemnego wykładu. Zapraszam naszego gościa. Dobry wieczór. Good evening. It's a tremendous privilege to be with you here tonight and especially to speak at a museum whose work is truly inspiring. It's also a privilege to be here because even though I'm teaching in Australia, I'm currently living in Toronto, Canada, and it was minus 40 Celsius uh, this week. So when I arrived in Warsaw, I felt as if I was in the tropics. So yes, thank you for that privilege. All right. So about 10 years ago, I was working here in Warsaw at Archivum Akt Novich, and among the documents in this archive are thousands of reports that were written by Polish police officers in the 1920s and 1930s concerning the political activity of interwar Poland's minority populations, who together made up nearly one third of the country's inhabitants. Among them were Ukrainians, Lithuanians, Belarusians, Germans, and of course, Jews. Jews made up about 10% of Poland's population. I was working with these documents because I was hoping that they could help me gain a better understanding of the dynamic and turbulent political lives of Jewish youth on the eve of the Holocaust. One afternoon, after hours of searching, there was one particular police report that caught my eye. It was written by a Polish police officer in October 1933. He had been instructed to attend a Zionist rally in Kobryn, a small shtetl or market town in eastern Poland and today in Belarus. This town had about 9,000 residents, 60% of them were Jewish. Now this rally was for a Zionist youth movement known as Betar. Betar was one of many movements in the country that competed with one another for the support of young Jews. Now these groups were socialist, Zionist, orthodox, secular, and every combination you could imagine. Of these groups, Betar was among the most popular. By the mid-1930s, Betar had over 60,000 members worldwide, and most of them lived here in Poland. The leaders of Betar, like those of other Zionist youth movements in Poland, 
promised to prepare their followers for a new life in the Jewish community of Palestine, which at the time was under British rule. They did so by providing Hebrew classes, lessons in Jewish history, and sometimes technical or agricultural training. At the time, Jews in Palestine were a minority. There were approximately 170,000 Jews living in Mandate Palestine, about 861,000 Arabs. Now, what made Beitar different from other Zionist movements was its commitment to the military training of Jewish youth. The heroes of other Zionist youth movements were farmers. Beitar's ideal Jew was a soldier. For them, rifles, not shovels, were the most important tools to fulfill Zionism's goals. They saw it as their duty to be ready at any moment to obey their commander and carry out whatever task he determined to be necessary to build a Jewish state. And that leader was Vladimir Jabotinsky, the founder of right-wing Zionism. Jabotinsky was described by his supporters and his opponents alike as one of the Zionist movement's most spellbinding orators, a brilliant writer, a magnetic personality, but also a provocative activist. Now, just by looking at the military uniforms of Beitar members, the Polish police officer in Kobrin would have likely known that this group of Jews looked different than other Zionists. But something else surprised him. He had expected the rally's organizers to devote their time to speaking about the duty of Jewish youth to support the Zionist project to build a state in Mandate Palestine. But instead, this officer was surprised as one after the other, the Beitar speakers got up on the stage and they told the hundreds of young Jews standing at attention in the audience that it was their duty as Zionists to defend the borders of Poland. He was especially impressed by a patriotic speech for Poland by one of the Beitar leaders. He was a skinny 19-year-old. He had thick, round black eyeglasses, a little bit like mine, and his hair was slicked to his side. And the Polish police officer decided to record his name. He said that men like Menachem Begin left a deep impression on the town's Jews. Menachem Begin. How many people here know who Menachem Begin is? Just, uh, okay. No. <laughs> so, I had a question. Why was it that Menachem Begin, who 44 years later became Israel's first right-wing prime minister, why would this man offer to put his life on the line for Poland? When he used to describe his youth in Poland, when he used to talk to Israelis, Menachem Begin spoke about humiliation, harassment, and violence that Jews experienced at the hands of the country's Polish majority. But this police report, where he is pledging his devotion to Poland, told a bit of a different story. Even more questions followed when I discovered that that one officer's report was just one of hundreds written by police officers in the 1930s concerning Beitar's activity. Some police officers reported that members of Beitar were laying wreaths at Polish war memorials and giving speeches where they told their followers to act Polish. Other police officials reported that during Polish national holidays, they would receive requests from Beitar members to march in parades alongside Polish scouts and soldiers. During street fights with Jewish socialists, 
Beitar could even be heard singing Mazurek Dombrovskiego, chanting Niech Zhiye Sanatsi. They're saying long live the Sanatsia, Sanatsia of course being the name given to Poland's government just after Józef Piłsudski's coup d'etat in 1926. So for historians of Jewish life in Poland before the Holocaust, the events that I've just described raise a lot of questions. Why would a Zionist movement, convinced that Jews were destined for a life of misery and persecution in Europe, choose the Polish national anthem as their battle cry? What exactly did Beitar's leaders mean when they told their followers to act Polish when they conducted military training? And what could it have possibly been about Poland that Zionists could see as a model to build a Jewish state in Mandate Palestine? And finally, how did their experiences of anti-Semitism in Poland influence the attitudes of Beitar members towards the Polish state and Polish nationalism? These are the questions that I would like to address in today's talk. I'm going to draw upon documents written in Hebrew, in Yiddish, and in Polish by Beitar's leaders and their followers. And in trying to answer these questions, what I hope will emerge is a portrait of some of the dynamics that shaped the national allegiances of young Polish Jews in the Second Republic. So let's start with the first question. Why would young Zionist Jews view Polish nationalism and Polish youth movement's culture as a model to emulate? Now, there was much that distinguished Jews from the region's non-Jewish majority. Religious beliefs and customs marked Poland's largely traditional Jewish population as a people apart. They had different eating habits, dress, educational patterns, and ritual calendars. Poland's Christian population was overwhelmingly made up of countryside peasants. Most Jews, however, lived in towns and cities, just barely making a living as peddlers, shopkeepers, and artisans. Jews also had to contend with long-standing Christian beliefs that they bore responsibility for the crucifixion of Christ and that they economically exploited their non-Jewish customers. These sorts of traditional hostilities against Jews were easily integrated into the modern anti-Semitism of political parties like the Endezia. But as the 1920s and 1930s progressed, and as anti-Semitism deepened in Poland, there was another contradictory trend. And this is the great paradox, I think, of Jewish life in Poland at this time. Even as anti-Semitism was growing in the 1930s, the Jews of Poland were increasingly adopting Polish linguistic, cultural, and social habits. No group was more affected by these changes than Jewish youth. By the late 1930s, as many as 80% of Jewish school-age children were attending a state public school. This was an experience that was unknown to their parents. The students spent as many as 12 hours a week learning Polish reading Polish romantic literature, Mickiewicz, Siemkiewicz, and listening to their teachers recount the history of Polish kings, noblemen, politicians, and soldiers. In their classes on Polish history and literature, Jewish students were told that if they joined the army, it would be the best way for them to gain acceptance in Poland. And these messages were reinforced by the teachers 
beyond the classroom, for example, on traditional Polish national holidays. Government officials told teachers to bring their students outside and to take them to parades where they could observe Polish soldiers marching in unison. Local military officials also sponsored scouting programs at the school, and they encouraged students to envision these scouting activities as preparation for serving in the Polish army. The Polish Scouting Association boasted hundreds of thousands of members. The scouting movement in Poland was established in 1910 to prepare future soldiers to liberate Poland. And in the Polish political imagination, this relationship between scouting and youth movements and military activity and national liberation was a core idea. Now, many of the Jewish graduates of these public schools not only viewed Polish as a natural language of communication, their experiences in the school also shaped the way in which they understood who they were and where they belonged in the Polish state. Historians that work on Jewish life in Poland, when trying to understand the lives of youth, are blessed to have a particular set of documents that allow us to enter into their world. This is an extraordinary collection of 300 or so autobiographies that were written by Polish Jewish youth in the 1930s as part of a competition that was run by a Jewish research institute. This institute asked young Jews throughout Poland to describe what their life was like, their home life, their life with school, um, their life with their friends, their experiences with religion. And of these 300 or so handwritten autobiographies, about 30 of them were written by members of Betar. So I had this great opportunity to read through them and it's really there that I saw how important the Polish public school was to their experience of this Zionist youth movement because these young people vividly describe the efforts of the teachers to give them a sense of Polish patriotism, of devotion to Poland. Many of them listed Polish literature and history as their favorite subjects. Now I need to be careful, this doesn't mean that these young Jews were abandoning their Jewish lives and trying to assimilate to become Polish. For example, a young member of Betar from the southeastern town of Hordenka wrote in Yiddish about how much he loved his Polish language teacher and how much he loved Polish literature and how much he loved Polish soldiers marching through the town. But then he also wrote about how much he loved praying in the synagogue with his father. Now at the same time, these autobiographies also capture a sense of confusion and frustration that many Betar members and Jewish students in general felt when they compared their newfound sense of Polish patriotism to the anti-Semitic behavior of their non-Jewish peers, of their Christian classmates. This behavior was often condoned on a local level by school and government authorities. I'd like to focus just on one example, and I'm going to share with you a part of an autobiography of a young man from Ostrowenka. Now, this autobiography contest promised the children that their names wouldn't be revealed. So he chose a, um, a sort of um, nickname for himself with the letters G and S. And he wrote his autobiography in 1939 in Yiddish. Now, in many respects, his life in Ostrowenka, a town about 120 kilometers northeast of Warsaw, was typical of a young Jew living in a shtetl, in a small market town. He was the son of a blacksmith, and in his autobiography, he writes a lot 
about the traditional Jewish institutions and rituals that shaped the daily life of his family. He spoke about how beautiful the town's synagogue was. He spoke about how he loved the sound of his father singing a special melody for a blessing over wine on the Jewish Sabbath. But like most of his contemporaries, his educational trajectory steered him beyond traditional Judaism. This is what he has to say about his experiences in the late 1920s in a public school. And I'm just going to quote from the autobiography. He writes, the atmosphere in which I found myself seemed entirely foreign. It's a new history with new kings, fresh heroes, wars, new nations. All of this made me a little bit confused and mixed up. In Yiddish, he writes a bissel zedreit und zemischt in Kopf, for anybody here who might understand Yiddish. He continues. He instilled in us, and he's speaking about the teacher, the teacher instilled in us with fervent passion, the Polish patriotic spirit. He told us that we have to love our fatherland and give it the greatest sacrifices. But he also used to tell us that the anti-Semitic acts carried out by hooligans were only carried out by extremists. I have to say, however, that the hateful stares of my Christian classmates that I encountered everywhere were all too clear. The feeling of being hit was too painful. You could close your mouth, you could grit your teeth in anger, but you could do nothing. These sentiments were shared by many of the young autobiographers that I read. Beitar members, though, believed that something, in fact, could be done. And this is what's fascinating. As I looked through handwritten journals from different shtetls throughout Poland, I found that there were often articles written by Beitar members that repeated a magical formula. If they adopted the military rituals of the Polish scouting youth movements, while at the same time insisting that they were different, that they were Zionists, Jews would finally gain the respect of their Christian neighbors. Now this idea actually has a very long history in the history of Zionism. The founder of Zionism, Theodore Herzl, also believed that anti-Semitism could be diminished if Jews fulfilled two paradoxical tasks. If they, on the one hand, asserted that they were different, that they were nationally unique, but if at the same time they became just like everyone else. So their own nation, but also pretty much the same as other nations. In other words, nations that deserve respect, that deserve independence. Now, I should say that not every member of Beitar joined the youth movement because of this experience with Polish nationalism. The autobiographies talk about a whole range of reasons why young Jews could join the youth movement. Probably the most popular one is that there was an attractive member of the opposite sex. Um, some things, I guess, never change. Still, these journals really do make it clear that the sort of Polish gaze, the gaze of the Polish neighbors watching Beitar members marching down the street was something that meant a great deal to these young Jews. And it's in fact these feelings that motivated the early followers of Vladimir Jabotinsky to form scouting movements in Poland. Now Vladimir Jabotinsky, when he arrived in Poland for the first time in 1927, he was greeted by Jewish scouting movements that called him their leader. And these groups were founded several years beforehand. Jabotinsky knew very little about them, but he was quite surprised when he got off at different um, 
train stations throughout the country and he sees young Jews dressed, dip, dressed up in what look like scouting uniforms cheering for him. These groups were organized, or many of them, by a man named Jakub Perelman. He was born and raised here in Warsaw, went to a Polish-speaking high school, and when the First World War broke out, or I should say actually when the Poland declared independence, he pledged to fight for Poland and to join the Polish army. He fought in the Polish-Soviet War, but like some Jewish soldiers at the time, he was actually arrested and imprisoned by the Polish army uh, for a period of time. So this sense of a, a little bit of betrayal from his comrades motivated him to create a Jewish military scouting organization that would look and feel like a Polish scouting association, but that would be Zionist. Jabotinsky noticed in addition to the fact that these scouts had positive um, attitudes towards Polish nationalism, he also noticed that his followers were calling themselves the Jewish Sanatia. That is to say, they were using the term Sanatia, the term of Yusuf Piłsudski's government after 1926, to describe the goals of right-wing Zionism. They saw a lot of parallels with what Piłsudski was trying to do in Poland in 1926. Piłsudski insisted when he took power that all of Poland's citizens had to believe that they were not only citizens but also soldiers fighting for the security of the state. He believed that the factionalism of the Polish government in the years that preceded 1926 was a danger to the country. He believed that in order for Poland citizens to transcend their differences, democracy couldn't be completely followed. It had to be changed, let's say, slightly. Um, and that semi-authoritarian rule had to exist at least until Poland was stable, both economically and politically. Right-wing Zionists felt that this was a model that made a lot of sense for Mandate Palestine. Much like Piłsudski, right-wing Zionists spoke of the political factionalism that paralyzed Jewish politics, not only in Poland, but in Mandate Palestine. This is a cartoon from a Yiddish language newspaper, and each of the different people represent a different Jewish political party. As you can see, not exactly um, one happy family. There was another reason why right-wing Zionists believe that Piłsudski's ideas made a lot of sense. They believe that in order for Jews to successfully build a state and mandate Palestine, they also had to believe that they were soldiers working together to build a state. And in addition, right-wing Zionists believe that democracy, even if it was an ideal, had to be postponed. And this makes a lot of sense in the context of Mandate Palestine in the 1920s and 1930s, because at this time, Jews were a minority. If they were to promote democracy immediately, this would essentially all but finish the Jewish dream of creating a state in Mandate Palestine. So as a result of all of these different dynamics, Jabotinsky embraced the idea that his movement in Poland should be known as the Jewish Sanatia. And the leaders of Beitar, of this youth movement, decided that it made sense to try to integrate Polish political culture and some elements of Polish patriotism into their worldview and practices. And that's what I'd like to talk about now. How exactly did right-wing Zionists integrate Polish nationalism into their culture? Well, they designed a variety of activities to encourage their members to see themselves as the heirs of Poland's patriotic traditions. 
And they designed these activities to allow young Jews to actually perform the qualities that they associated with Polish identity. I'm just going to provide you with a few fascinating examples. First, the Beitar leadership assigned the classics of Polish literature for their young followers to read. Except in their curriculum guidelines, they told them to read Polish literature as if it was a model for Zionist activity in Mandate Palestine. For example, Władysław Raymond's novels about peasant life, when read with Zionist glasses, they became stories about the physical and spiritual resilience of people harvesting food on an inhospitable soil. Beitar leaders actually, how do I put this? They, um, they admired the Polish peasant. They described the Polish peasantry as having an intuitive sense of duty to the state. For example, in one of the first conferences of Beitar in Białystok, in 1929, the leader of Beitar gave a whole speech about Polish peasants, and the speech is in Yiddish. And he says to these young Jews in the audience, have you ever gone up to a Polish peasant and asked him, do you read Marx? The answer is, of course, no. The Polish peasant would never read Marx. He knows that it's foolish. He knows that it is his duty to obey to fight for Poland and to fight for the state and to fight for his nation. <coughs> Beitar also translated some uh, Polish literature into Hebrew. You can see on the right here a story about Polish cavalry waiting to attack, except it's written in Hebrew or translated. The other thing that Beitar did is that they actually used the textbooks published by the Polish scouting movement. These texts not only allowed Beitar members to literally perform step by step the same choreography that their Catholic peers were engaging in, young Jews were also encouraged to uncover parallels between the textbook's descriptions of the value of military training with those that were offered in Beitar's curriculum guidelines in Hebrew and in Yiddish. For example, the Polish scouting textbook, one of the first ones, was written in the future tense. In other words, when it spoke to young Poles, it spoke about preparing for a future of fighting for national liberation. This made a lot of sense for young Jews who were thinking about building a Jewish state and also fighting for national liberation in the future. One of the other elements of these scouting textbooks that were very popular among Beitar members was the idea of behaving like a knight, behaving um, like a, how do I put this, a noble soldier, uh, being chivalrous, being polite, um, the, things like that. Um, these concepts w w were throughout the Polish scouting textbooks, and you can also see them in Beitar's curriculum. One of the other things that Beitar members and leaders did is they constantly compared Vladimir, Jab sorry, Vladimir Jabotinsky to Yusuf Piłsudski. They noted that both Piłsudski and Jabotinsky were charismatic military leaders. Piłsudski was the founder, of course, of the Polish Legion. Jabotinsky, in 1917, had founded a Jewish legion under the auspices of the British, and the hope was at the time that this Jewish legion would help to liberate Palestine, which at the time was under Ottoman rule. Beitar members believed that both Piłsudski and Jabotinsky were driven by this all-encompassing ambition for statehood and national unity and that both leaders called for a military ethos to pervade civil society.
Beitar leaders also created a variety of public rituals to transform public landmarks in Poland that were associated with Polish nationalism into Zionist sites. And probably the most popular of these rituals was the laying of wreaths at Polish war memorials. Now, Polish war memorials throughout the country served as starting or ending points of Polish patriotic celebrations throughout the year. Beitar members generally followed a common choreography when staging the event. They would start with being at the synagogue, and they would have a memorial service for Jews who had lost their lives in battles against Arabs in Mandate Palestine. From there, Beitar members would leave the synagogue, they would file out, and they would march through the streets of the town or city towards the main war memorial, and they would lay a wreath. So they are, in a sense, performing a commemorative ritual that pays tribute to Jews who died fighting in the name of Zionist ideals at the exact same place where Polish scouts and military commemorate Polish soldiers. And by doing this, Beitar members could actually envision Poles and Jews as comrades in arms. One of the things that is fascinating about these parades was that Beitar's members were not the only constituency that was kept in mind by the youth movement's leaders. Beitar leaders saw these public celebrations as opportunities to get support from local and national Polish government officials. In some cases, in fact, Polish officials were even invited to take part in the ceremonies themselves. And when you read Beitar's uh, newsletters or newspapers, different groups or different um, you know, groups in small towns across the country often compete with one another to see how many Polish officials participated in these events. Now, Beitar leaders hoped that by inviting Polish officials to these events, it meant that these Polish officials might be able to provide some financial or even tactical support to the Beitar movement. And they're thinking especially of one particular thing. What Beitar members are hoping is that they can participate in local government paramilitary youth training groups. These are groups that were founded by Piłsudski in 1927 they gained over 300,000 participants by the early 1930s. Under the auspices of these programs, thousands of Beitar members were offered basic military training, including how to use guns. Their participation in these groups also gave them the privilege of marching next to Polish soldiers during Polish national celebrations. <coughs> now, in some cases, Beitar's displays of an alliance with the military training program's officials could provide the leaders of Beitar with a sense of prestige, maybe even a sense of power among local Jews. Just one example, the man at the center here is named Yaakov Hetman. He was a Beitar leader in the town of Lubomol. He later recalled in Hebrew, and I'll just quote from his memoir, he wrote, I became a kind of unofficial representative of Lubomol's Jews to the authorities. Suddenly, I found myself a young 18-year-old man representing the local Jews just by my power as a Beitar leader. Now, he's writing this many years later, and it's possible that he is um, exaggerating, let's say. But still, his memoir provides a window into the types of power Beitar members and leaders believed they could attain through personal interactions with Polish government officials. 
I'd like to turn to the final question of today's lecture, and that is, how did the experience of increasing anti-Semitism in Poland influence all of these performances of patriotism towards Poland? How did it impact the attitudes of Beitar leaders and members towards Polish nationalism? We need to remember, for example, that when the Polish government decided to provide support to right-wing Zionists, it wasn't because they had a deep affection for Jews. Mostly, they were drawn to Beitar's promise to help the Polish government suppress socialism and communism among Jewish youth. Polish government officials believed that many, if not most, young Jews were attracted to communism. And even though this is an inaccurate statement, Beitar leaders were happy to, in a sense, accept it if it meant that they could receive the help of Polish government officials. Uh, Beitar saw communism and socialism as the enemy. They often engaged in fights with Jewish socialists. So this alliance made some sense to Polish government officials. Polish government officials also supported right-wing Zionists because Vladimir Jabotinsky in 1936 called for the mass evacuation of millions of Jews from Poland and elsewhere in Eastern Europe. In other words, the Zionist quest for a Jewish state in Mandate Palestine was, in the view of Polish officials, one of several potentially viable options to deplete their Jewish population. Many Polish Jewish organizations, in fact, accused Jabotinsky of supporting Polish anti-Semitism when Jabotinsky claimed that Polish government attitudes and the attitudes of the Polish population towards Jews, their desire for Jews to leave, was in a sense a natural reaction to the country's difficult economic circumstances. Now, Beitar had to contend with anti-Semitism in Poland as it worsened in the 1930s. From the early 1930s, radical Polish nationalist youth tried to impose a countrywide economic boycott on Jewish stores. Jewish university youth were often the favorite target of physical attacks. They were the target of a campaign to create ghetto benches in universities across the country. Now, the government viewed these radical Polish nationalists as a threat to their power, but they believed that the best way to preserve their power was to adopt anti-Semitic measures of their own. In the final years of the 1930s, the Polish parliament passed several anti-Jewish measures, including a ban on the slaughter of kosher meat. So, in the face of all of this, how do Beitar's leaders and membership respond to these developments? I think that the story here is fascinating, precisely because it is so difficult to tell. Because there were multiple factors that could play a role in configuring the responses of individual Polish Jewish youth in Beitar to anti-Semitism. I'd like to focus on two potential factors, geography and language. Most of Beitar's activists living in areas that prior to Polish independence were under Russian rule, were born and raised in Yiddish speaking and religiously observant homes located in small towns across the country. Their main newspaper was a Yiddish newspaper called Unter Welt. In contrast, Beitar's leadership in areas that used to be under Habsburg rule, so areas in Galicia, these were the children of Polish-speaking lawyers, engineers, dentists. They were raised speaking Polish at home, and their main newspaper was in Polish. When these two newspapers reported acts of anti-Jewish violence, in other words, acts of radical Polish nationalists uh, against Jews, they had two very different ways of reporting. The activists in Warsaw 
tended to speak about anti-Semitism as a pathological issue among the Polish masses. In other words, they called it a kind of mass psychosis. They also blamed the Polish government for these outbreaks, and they called upon Jewish youth to engage in self-defense, and even in some instances to retaliate. In stark contrast, Beitar's leadership in Galicia, when they wrote in their Polish language newspaper, Tribuna Narodowa, tended to describe acts of anti-Jewish violence as the acts of a small number of extremists. They spoke about these acts of violence as an act against the entirety of Polish society, and they tended to refrain from calling on Jewish youth to engage in self-defense. So why this difference? One important difference, perhaps, is the question of censorship. Government censors were constantly looking through Jewish newspapers to look for potential sentences or phrases that could be viewed as a betrayal to the Polish state. So they were more likely to censor the Polish newspapers, although in fact there were officials in the Polish government who read Yiddish and who did engage in some censorship of Yiddish newspapers. So this means that Beitar leaders writing in Polish knew that government officials would read what they were writing. They were especially nervous or concerned that if Polish government officials read anything that might be considered um, a challenge to the Polish state, that the Polish government would take away the military training that they were providing Beitar's members. To give you one example of how that might play out, remember I showed you this picture of Yaakov Hetman in Lubomo. So at first he described himself as this leader who was supported and beloved by Polish government officials. But in 1937, there is an attack against a group of old Jews, elderly Jews, on a Friday night. And some of them are beaten severely. He decides to get together a group of Beitar members and to patrol the streets. And if they hear that another attack is happening, that they would go and defend these Jews. So another attack begins. This group of Beitar members in Lubomo fight with the Polish nationalists engaging in the violence. And ultimately, they send one of them to a hospital. Immediately, the Polish government stops giving them military support. And they also take away um, Yaakov Hetman's uh, visa. He was hoping to go to Mandate Palestine, but they forbid him from doing so. So this very much could happen. Now, we also need to be a little bit careful, because what I've described so far might lead us to the presumption that all of these public performances of patriotism for Poland were just designed to get something, right? They were pragmatic. It meant that if I say out loud, I love the Polish state, if I say out loud, I love Poland, it means that we'll receive military support. And there's no question that for some Beitar members, this was an important factor. However, at the exact same time, we see other Beitar members, when they're writing to their fellow Beitar peers, when they write to them, they tell them that they have to persist to believe in Polish patriotism and to support Poland. They insisted that Beitar members could persist in spite of the rise of anti-Semitism to view their patriotism for Poland as an integral component of their Zionism. Here is just one of two examples that I'll give. In June 1938, Beitar members in the southeastern town of Yarostov were informed that their fellow Beitar member, Oziasz Stor, who was serving as a soldier in the Polish army, he had been killed during a battle over the Polish-Czechoslovak border. And they explain in this death notice that in defending the borders of the Polish Republic, he fulfilled his duty as a Beitar member. 
and that they should pledge their faith to the ideals that this young man so fervently loved. So defending the borders of Poland, fulfilling his duties as a Zionist, as if these two things make perfect sense. Or we might take this publication. This was by Beitar members for Beitar members, and it was written in May 1939. The article was written by a young Beitar member named Severin Liva, and in this article he makes an impassioned plea to the youth movement's members to contribute to Poland's National Defense Fund. In the article he writes, every Jew has a right and responsibility to make financial sacrifices for their Polish fatherland, as well as for the rebuilding of the Jewish state in Palestine. Even more fascinating, this, these words were followed in the article by a string of slogans, Polish nationalist slogans and Zionist slogans, and they would just be one after the other, as if their combination was a natural state of being bearing absolutely no need for explanation. In fact, I wonder about whether or not when Leva ended this article with the well-known rallying cry of the 1831 Polish uprising, za naszą i waszą wolność, whether or not he envisioned the task of Beitar members to be not only to liberate, mandate Palestine from British rule, but also to set Poland free from the anti-Semitism that was sweeping the country. So to conclude this lecture, what then does it mean to be a Polish Jew or to have two fatherlands? In many ways, the case of right-wing Zionism's relationship to Polish nationalism captures the dynamism of Polish Jewish identity between the two world wars. It is difficult, if not impossible, to provide any generalizations about how Jews negotiated their commitments to Polish nationalism and Zionism. Given the diversity of Poland's Jewish population, there was little consensus among them about what it meant to be a Polish Zionist Jew. Some members of Beitar viewed the Polish national struggle as an inspiration but they also insisted that they felt no connection to the Polish state and that they were foreigners waiting to travel to their distant homeland. Other Beitar members insisted that they had two fatherlands. And then there were those within Beitar who simply vacillated between these two options over the course of their lives. Or they simply accepted the numerous inconsistencies that characterized their political affiliations. And it's these inconsistencies that are often so difficult for historians to capture. In fact, historians who write about this period and who write about Polish-Jewish relations use that term, Polish-Jewish relations, to describe interactions between Jews and Catholics in Poland. One of the limits of this term is that it risks giving the impression that the words Polish and the words Jewish were fixed terms that clearly separated one group's ethnic, religious, and political sense of self and community from the other. The case of Beitar demonstrates that in a way, this term doesn't exactly work. In fact, perhaps our vocabulary fails us. Perhaps we aren't really able to convey the complexity of a group's identity or identities with one simple term. Now, this article was written in May 1939, and it was only four months later that the Wehrmacht invaded Poland, bringing a fate to Polish Jews far more horrific than anyone would have dared to imagine. But when one listens to this young man's voice, one doesn't hear the voice of a young man who believed that his life and those of his readers were poised for destruction. One hears instead a young man who was unapologetically fighting for the right to determine who he was, where he belonged, and what his future held in store. And although 
he was only addressing Beitar members, I think that his insistence that Polish Jewish youth still had a role to play in shaping their own fate, I think this message would have likely resonated with many young Polish Jews at the end of the 1930s. I'd like to end the lecture just by providing one passage from one of the autobiographies that I read. And this young man was writing, much like Severin, in 1939. And this is what he has to say. Young people live with hope and faith in a bright future. Those who are deeply convinced believe. But there is this question as to when that day will come. When do we stop hoping? No one has determined this for us yet. Thank you so much. Mamy teraz czas na pytania, także jeżeli macie Państwo pytania do profesora, to zapraszam. And I must apologize. I'm putting these on not because I'm ignoring you, but for the translation. Thank you so much. Can I sit down or? Oczywiście. Okay, it will be maybe easier. Uh, thank you for your lecture and uh, thank you for your uh, uh, words about uh, about uh, Betar. Uh, I think uh, Betar is uh, is generally uh, an absent uh, theme, an absent subject. So uh, any word you could uh, say about about them is uh, is really precious. Uh, I think that uh, maybe, uh, well, in time, uh, you could also say something about the next period, so about uh, this period, uh, 1939 and 1943, because they, they were also active in that period. But I have uh, one question. Uh, you said about uh, these 300 biographies, and you uh, read only one. Uh, which was uh, quite negative, uh, let's say, and and you said uh, there were many uh, uh, similar, ma ma many others like this. So my question is like this: What does it mean, many? Yes. Uh, so because uh, if we want to to be uh, honest, uh, it's good to say uh, uh, well how many of of those three uh, hundreds uh, were really like like this mm -hmm. and uh, again uh, why only 300 uh, of them uh, decided to write uh, something like this uh, because uh, if this 300s are also uh, one percent of uh, of the others then we still don't know yes. uh, how to um, how to deal uh, with this uh, one uh, special biography, which which is negative, because all other things which you, uh, which you said uh, uh, we can really take uh, uh, as as a very positive uh, approach to uh, to Polish na nationalism and and uh, and uh, to Polish nation, to Polish peasants, and and generally to to Poles. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your question. Uh, the question of sources and what what makes, firstly, a reliable source and what makes a representative source are very important questions that historians constantly ask. Um, my answer to your question about the autobiography is indebted tremendously to a wonderful Polish historian, a uh, historian of Poland, a guy by the name of Kamil Kijek, who has written the most important book, I think, on these autobiographies. Now, he's read all of them very closely, um, and I, I strongly recommend his work. I think that what Kamil would say, and what I would say as well, is that most of the autobiographies that describe the Polish public school describe this tension between let's say, um, admiration for Polish language, Polish culture, Polish history, but also the experience of anti-Semitism of peers. Um, 
uh, I don't think Camille would give this number, but I'll, I'll give a percent, I'd say, of the autobiographies. And I, I, I read more than 30, um, but for this particular lecture, that's, that's what I was um, focusing on. I would say 60 to 70 percent, probably, describe things in that way. A smaller number, though, and no less significant, describe very positive relations with uh, their Polish schoolmates or their Polish neighbors. Um, I think if I've learned anything about this period is that generalizations always never really get at the, the real story. Um, I felt that that autobiography was representative because in part it complemented so many of the other writings I found in these handwritten journals written by these young Jews that describe this anti-Semitism on the one hand, but then also putting on uniform and changing the perception of Catholic Poles. I, I hope I sufficiently addressed that, that question. I have uh, here. Um, mm, I think uh, it appears that all ideologies are entangled in all sorts of uh, 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 dilemmas and uh, nationalist ideology ideologies uh, is particularly, I think, prone to such uh, mm, such difficulties. And in relation to that, three quick questions. One, you said rightly that uh, Jews were a tiny or a small minority in Poland, ten percent. They were a similar minority in the pa in Palestine. How how yeah, would they? Poland. What were their plans to? deal with that issue. It was not an insignificant one. <laughs> Two, uh, second question. Uh, sometimes it's said that Jabotinsky and, and, uh, and his movement were fascinating by fascism, yes. in particular Benito Mussolini and of fascist Italy. Whatever happened to that uh, with the ev evolution of, of history as we know it and the Holocaust story? And third question, it appears that, that that this movement would be the ideal one for the setting up of uh, of independent Israel in 1948, and still it appears that a different faction of Zionism would take uh, control of that. And what is the place of Beitar in the historical memory of Israel today, and what is uh, the role that is attached to to their? Uh, fights. Okay. In in Yiddish, they have a phrase of emphasis, which means like to stand on one foot and answer those three questions um, quickly and succinctly. Um, so you'll forgive me if I don't cover all of them w in tremendous depth. So the first question um, is the question of how exactly did Zionists in the interwar period imagine the uh, ability to create a Jewish majority? in Mandate Palestine, given that they were a minority. By 1939, they made up about a third, or 33% of the population. This was a question that provoked tremendous debate in the Zionist movement. Um, the main faction of Zionists that were popular in Mandate Palestine were known as the Labour Zionists. They were led by a man named David Ben-Gurion, who would later become the first Prime Minister of Israel. And the public statement that he gave and that his group gave for most of the 1920s and, and early 1930s was that ultimately it would be by farming and building up the land, it would be a sort of peaceful and slow process through which Jews would ultimately have a state. By the late 1930s, um, during a period known as the Arab Revolt that started in 1936, when um, Palestinian Arabs begin to not only target the British, but also Jewish civilians, Ben-Gurion changes his ideas a bit, begins to flirt with the idea that military engagement is inevitable um, in the future creation of a Jewish state. Revisionists were different. In 1923, Jabotinsky writes this very famous essay called The Iron Wall, where he says that you cannot find one group in the world of an, an indigenous population impacted by colonialism or by settlers who simply say, OK, go for it. Instead, he says, Jabotinsky, military engagement is inevitable. And that is what the Zionist movement needs to prepare for. Um, I'm going to skip to your third question and get to your second one last, because in some ways, you're right. The creation of the state, which 
took place during the 19, well, first the, with the UN resolution, but then after with the 1948 war, seems in many respects to justify Jabotinsky's prophecy that military engagement would be a necessary condition for the creation of the state. So what role then did right-wing Zionists play? The answer is controversial, let's say. Um, firstly, numerically, um, Right-wing Zionists were a minority, a very small minority, in um, 1948 with the creation of the State of Israel. Some of them joined the main Israel Defense Forces. In fact, most of them ultimately did. Um, in the early years of that war, there was a uh, faction called Lehi. It was a right-wing Zionist um, uh, in the 30s, it was a guerrilla organization, and it later engaged in battle with Palestinian Arabs. Um, but they were quickly subsumed into the Israel Defense Forces. Now, when the state is created, Menachem Begin, that first guy I showed you, and his group of right-wing Zionists are very, 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 very small in the Israeli parliament. He really doesn't come into power, and right-wing Zionism doesn't really grow until the 1967 war and then after. The memory of right-wing Zionist participation in all of this, the memory changes fundamentally depending on the time period. After 1948, the participation of right-wing Zionists was suppressed. After 1977, when Menachem Begin becomes prime minister, what's one of the first things he does? He tries to promote that story again. Your third question, and forgive me, I know I'm going on and on. So. Um, Right-wing Zionists were often accused by their opponents in interwar Poland as being, in Yiddish they called them Yiddish fascistlich, which means like uh, little Jewish fascists. What makes this even more interesting is that some of Beitar's members describe themselves as Jewish fascists. Um, I have a chapter in my book that addresses this question. Um, Part of what's interesting about Beitar's, or some of Beitar members that describe themselves as fascists is they didn't quite know what the term meant in much the same way that many groups, including Polish nationalist groups that flirted with the term as well, they often debated what the term meant, like what were the different criteria that you needed to fulfill. Certainly, um, commitment to uh, believing in a military ethos in society, the commitment of obedience to a leader, but there were questions about the role of violence against one's enemies that Beitar debated a great deal. Um, once Hitler comes to power, that term fascist vanishes from Beitar's publications, more or less. <coughs> Ich will sagen, dass ich ja jüdische Faschist bin. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I will speak yes. in Polish. Dobrze. Uh, and Sie auf Jiddisch. Uh, no, no, no. Polish. Polish. I think that, in fact, on the street of politics, in Poland, on the street of Żydowski, especially in the sector of Żydowski, was very different. No i w sektorze polskiej ludności oczywiście też. Ale jednak trzeba znaleźć jakieś, uważam, zasadnicze linie podziału. I ja myślę, że linia podziału w końcu nie była Żydzi, Polacy, tylko lewica i prawica. I Bejtar w końcu był sojusznikiem polskiej sanacji. No, Piłsudski był, nie był antysemitą, fakt. Tego nie można zaprzeczyć. Ale jeżeli się popatrzy na ideologię Bejtaru i rewizjonistów, to oni są nawet bliżsi polskiemu niesocjalistycznemu nacjonalizmowi, ale nawet endecji. Ale endecja była antysemicka. Także i, i pamiętajmy, kiedy się faszystlech, że gdzieś do 1936 roku, pani tam nadąża za mną, i Żabutyński był dobrym przyjacielem Mussoliniego, że on założył tam szkołę morską. I że to, że Ben Gurion i Hewre, to znaczy i, i chłopcy z, z, z Apoel, bili bejtarystów i w Tel Awiwie, i w Warszawie, i wołali na nich faszyści, to nie było zupełnie bez, bez przyczyny. No i skracam się, jeszcze chciałbym powiedzieć, że trzeba rozróżnić w procesach 
kulturowych polskiego żydowstwa w okresie międzywojnia między asymilacją a akulturacją. Akulturacja hmm. była yes. obiektywnym procesem, wejściem w inną kulturę, która była możliwa, która była zabroniona za czasów carskich. A w Polsce z wszystkimi problemami Żydzi żyli w kraju bardziej demokratycznym. I to, to się kończyło tym, że na przykład w Słonimie żydowski chłopak śpiewał już taki jestem zimny drań. Ta, ta kultura na niego działała to tego. No więc yy, yy, kończąc, podaję pan tu bardzo ciekawy przykład. Na ile żydowska prawica była sojusznikiem polskiej prawicy. Ten storch, Pan, pan pokazał tutaj ten tą ne, 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 nekrolog, klepsydrę o śmierci tego żołnierza, prawda? No ale ten żołnierz wpadł jako sojusznik Hitlera, bo przecież inwazja do Czechosłowacji i wejście polskiej armii do Zaoldzia to było według i to, to było według no, umowy no, paktów w Monachium, prawda? No. Nie, no ale to, ale, ale to było w końcu wynikiem. Polska urwała swój kawałek, kiedy rozerwano Czechosłowację. To jest historyczny fakt. No więc już, za dużo gadać. Ok, uh, ok. Uh, I'd say 80% of your comments, I, I was so close to simply saying thank you so much for your enriching uh, the comments that I think added a good degree of, of nuance and things that are important to remember. I, I would certainly disagree with your final statement that as a Polish soldier who was really just commanded to go to battle in defense of Poland that he was allied with Hitler, ultimately. I think there's some confusion there. Um, a small anecdote about Jabotinsky and Mussolini. Um, yes, it's true that uh, the Beitar movement did found a naval school. Mostly Polish Jews went there in fascist Italy in the 1930s. Jabotinsky had a kind of strange attitude toward Mussolini. In his letters that he'd write to his friends, he would often say that he was afraid of the cult of leadership that people had for Mussolini. But at the same time, he kind of cultivated that image in Beitar. So this was someone who kept saying to his friends, oh, I just wish I could be more democratic, but in practice, he behaved differently. I have a microphone, so I have a voice. <laughs> I, I would like to raise two, two questions. Uh, first of all, as far as I understood, you said that this mixture of Zionism with Polish patriotism is something exceptional among the Jewish organizations mm. uh, living in diaspora. I must say that I did some research some time ago about um, the American yes, the, very similar. Uh, Zionism. And uh, I looked through the newspapers and I noticed that in the quarrel between the Zionists and anti-Zionists, there was a strong argument that the anti-Zionists named the Zionists the, the traitors of the United States. Yeah. And uh, the Zionists just were proving very strongly that we are both American patriots and Jewish patriots too. And we want to have this homeland in Palestine. So it was not so ex exceptional as far as I read, but maybe, and even before Jabotinsky organized his, his, his legion it was uh, present in the Amer American debate. The second problem is uh, about, is not connected s so much with the topic you raised, is the, 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 the question about the girls. Yes. Because I noticed a lot of girls on the pictures you, you presented and uh, were they also accepted as a members of this organization or not? Or, 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 or what was the role of the girls? Thank you so much for your, your question. Um, so f firstly, I, thank you for the comparison with the American context. In some ways, I think that Betar is, <laughs> sounds like just what I was saying about Zionism, just like every other nation, but not. Um, in some ways, 
Beitar is like pretty much every iteration of Zionism in the interwar period, wherever you may find it, in that many Zionists throughout the world translate Zionist ideology into a local idiom. So for example, you mentioned American Zionism, where they say to be a Zionist is to be a good US Democrat and to bring some of those values to mandate Palestine or the future Jewish state. In Czechoslovakia, it's not Piłsudski, it's Masaryk. So in that way, there's similarity. I'd say the biggest difference is that I can't think of any other example of a Zionist youth movement that works so closely with a government in order to try to realize its goals. So it's, I think it's more than just ideological proclamations. I think there's something really fascinating happening there. Your second question is a critical one, and it's the question of, of women. Women are so often invisible in the historical scholarship about Polish Jewish life. Some of the best work about women now is being produced here in Poland. Um, Karolina Szymaniak, I, I have to mention her name, along with Kamil, uh, just an extraordinary scholar. Um, and I, I do write about the girls in my book. So about 50% of the Beitar leadership were women. Uh, sorry, the, the Beitar members were, were young women. And like pretty much every other Jewish political group in this period, much like really most political groups in Poland, there were debates about the roles that women could play in the movement. Could a woman really pick up a gun? Should a woman really train as a soldier? Should these young girls train alongside the boys? Might that lead, one, one person said it might lead to sexual assimilation, where the men would somehow turn into women. It's, uh, anyways. So this debate kept going and going until finally, Vladimir Jabotinsky wrote a article in um, the Beitar newspaper in 1933, basically saying each group should basically deal with these questions on their own. And that's exactly what happened. Some groups were co-ed, some groups women participated fully in all of the activities of Beitar. Other groups had separate uh, groups, they weren't co-ed. Um, some of them, women could wear pants. In other ones, they wore skirts. This would depend on the religiosity of the women. It was up to individual choice and also the politics of the location. That said, in all of the contexts, women were taught to engage in military self-defense. Sorry, thank you. Ja króciutko. Chciałam pana zapytać o coś takiego. W Polsce w międzywojniu, tak, a teraz, dobrze, w Polsce w międzywojniu odbywała się, chodzi mi o to, czy analizując zachowania betarowców dzieci, młodzieży, pytał pan się o to, co myśleli o tym ich rodzice. Jest to dlatego dla mnie ważne pytanie, że w Polsce w międzywojniu odbywała się ogromna walka o dzieci mniejszości narodowych i o chłopskie dzieci. Mało, na co dzień nie wiemy o tym, że chłopi wcale nie chcieli posyłać dzieci do szkoły, ale ja widziałam, przeglądając w archiwach materiały szkolne z międzywojnia, że nie wszyscy Żydzi chcieli je posyłać do szkoły i niektóre elementy w szkole polskiej uważali za groźne dla swojej rodziny i w spory między szkołą a rodzicem żydowskim musiał się nawet y, angażować inspektor szkolny. Chciałam y, pana zapytać, y, jak rodzice patrzyli yes. na Betar? Co było dla nich, y, jakby, gdzie tutaj widzieli, czy tu było jakieś zagrożenie nowoczesnością, coś było dla nich groźne, czy to było do zaakceptowania? Thank you so much for your uh, question, and I'm so delighted that you've conducted research on this question of the relationship between parents and children and generational conflict. G generational conflict is a theme that runs throughout the interwar period, not only in Jewish organizations, but Polish organizations as well. Um, you would constantly see in Yiddish and Polish language periodicals, Hebrew as well, this theme of the conflicts between parents and their children. The autobiographies are uneven. In other words, each, when I think about it, each person tells a bit of a different story. I remember one autobiography where this young girl uh, from a Hasidic family so desperately wants to go to the Polish public school. Her father forbids it. The mother takes her aside and says, just let me, let me work on this a little bit. And ultimately, she manages to go to the school. The next step is she starts reading Polish literature at home. The father says, this is terrible. The mother says, 
let me just work on this. That's one example. Um, I don't know if that resonates with anyone here. Um, then, of course, there are some instances where these kids come from Polish-speaking homes, for example, in Galicia. So I recall uh, an autobiography from uh, Lwów, where there's no problem attending a Polish public school, um, but there is a problem with Zionism. So I, I wish I could offer more generalizations, but I think you're right, this, this tension between parents and children certainly runs like a thread throughout these stories. Thank you. Do we have time? Let me just quickly ask, do we have time for one or two more questions? Yes. Two more questions. OK. OK. My question is, I think, quite simple. You mentioned uh, several times that for uh, authors of these autobiographies, uh, religion was a very important element, uh, very sentimental for them, synagogue and memories connected with the experience in synagogue was important. So my question is if uh, also in the autobiographies or perhaps in Jabotinsky's writings, uh, there are some uh, uh, elements which could uh, help us to understand how they uh, um, evaluated the role of the Catholic Church. I mean, mm. priests, hierarchy, uh, in uh, shaping uh, the anti-Semitism, because the Polish anti-Semitism had this extremely uh, important uh, religious component. Yes. And without uh, the, the very strong participation of clergy, of course, uh, Endetia will not have, uh, we know this from uh, Krzywiec's books, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, this alliance between Dmowski and, and, and church, it yes. made possible that yes. anti-Semitism became an important part of the ideology of Andesia. So in Betar, uh, they have this uh, sense uh, that clergy hmm. contributed to, to, to anti-Semitism. So I, I, your, I think your de depiction of the role of the church is entirely accurate. There's no question. I mean, when I was reading Polish curriculum guidelines for the religious class, so the class in religion that would happen in every public school. I mean, it would say things like Jews are responsible for the death of Christ, and every Jew in the present day bears guilt for that. I, so this is, and, and, and you know, uh, Shvetz's work is is entirely on point. Um, however, when I think about all the articles I read, not one of them actually, when talking about anti-Semitism, talks about Catholicism. And it's not because they didn't think about it. This actually, it poses a question I never really thought about how to answer. Why, why the absence? And I have no answer, but I'm gonna, this, I will carry this question with me on the plane uh, back home. <laughs> Thank uh, you. This uh, is not, uh, oh, sorry. this is not uh, exactly the topic of, of, of tonight's excellent lecture, but you may have run into some data in your studies, and we did talk about 1948 and the resurfacing of Betar in independent Israel, or in the formation, or mm -hmm. later on. Uh, I'm curious uh, whether having been, Betar was a small fraction of the, of the Jewish population before the war. Yes, in mandate Palestine. Uh, yes. yes. Uh, now, would it be did it help uh, being a member of Betar to survive the occupation or on the contrary? In other words, or was it just irrelevant? Right. I think that the answer that historians of the Holocaust would give is that there are so many factors that would determine the fate of Jews that would be, you know, that would determine whether they would survive or not, that it's difficult to say that Betar members would necessarily have a higher rate of survival. My sense is that their fate is exactly like the fate of others. A more difficult question emerges um, about the role of Betar in resistance and uprising movements, um, and, and that I can speak a little bit about. Um, for decades, um, the state of Israel, which was at the time run by labor Zionists, tried to suppress the fact that right-wing Zionists participated in uprisings against the Nazis in Poland. Um, th probably the most famous example, of course, is the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Um, and how they participated really depended on where. In Warsaw, it was a separate organization, but in, in many small market towns where resistance activity took place, they actually did 
coordinate their activities with different Zionist groups, sometimes even socialist groups. It's a, it's a reminder, and this is true for the interwar period, how important the local context is um, to the story. Um, there's also the question of the Judenrat. Um, there are some claims that Beitar members uh, or Beitar leaders were more likely to join the Judenrat. Um, I, I didn't find that to be the case. Um, what I found was that in some instances, Beitar members are very much against the Judenrat, and then in some instances, in some cases, they are members. And it's just, it's very difficult to generalize. I think that's it. Thank you so much for your patience with me and for attending this talk. I, I truly appreciate it.